coming into this particular meeting, even the weeks leading up to it, like I could feel it. And even kind of walking into the room, like I definitely had a feeling that it was gonna be, yeah, I expected it to be difficult. From High Tech High, this is the Unbox Learning Podcast. I'm Alec Patton. This episode is part of a series we're calling Groundwork, where I'm talking to school leaders who are laying the groundwork for something big. Anything from transforming their school's culture to building a new school from scratch. These conversations are raw, they're inspiring, sometimes they're a little crazy. I love doing them and I'm so excited to be able to share them with you. In this episode, I'm talking to Joe Truss, principal of Visitation Valley Middle School, a local public school in San Francisco. Last year, Joe decided his staff was going to tackle white supremacy culture head on. Some of my colleagues heard about this and invited Joe to lead our sixth annual equity deep dive, and he made some time to sit down and talk about the journey that his school's been on and about some of the ways that growing up in a culture predicated on white supremacy shaped his own childhood. But before we go into that, a couple quick definitions. First, white supremacy culture. The group Showing Up for Racial Justice defines white supremacy culture as the ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to those of people of color. And we're not talking about cross burnings and swastikas here. We're talking about students of color getting suspended more often than white students. We're talking about which authors are taught in English class. And we're talking about the relative importance a history teacher gives to the fact that George Washington led the Continental Army versus the fact that he ran an organization based at Mount Vernon that imprisoned, tortured, and trafficked hundreds of people for his personal financial gain. If that description of America's first president made you feel defensive, and you're white, now is a good time to introduce our second quick definition, white fragility. Sociologist Robin D'Angelo defines this as a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. These moves include the outward display of emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and leaving the stress-inducing situation. So, to give an example, let's say a white person heard that description of slavery at Mount Vernon that I just gave, immediately said, it's not fair to judge George Washington by the standards of our time, and change the subject. That would be an instance of white fragility. Okay, that's enough introduction. Here's my conversation with Joe Truss. I welcome Joe Truss, principal of Visitation Valley Middle School. Oh, thank you so much for coming out. So you grew up in the Tenderloin District in Mm. San Francisco. And on your website, it says that you found solace in your studies. Mm. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so, you know, the Tenderloin was a pretty, you know, there's lots of rough neighborhoods around the country. And as I've traveled, I definitely learned that there are much rougher places to live. However, as a kid, I definitely realized it was, a, it was a, a tough place. I mean, this is the 80s. This is the inner city. This is the time when crack cocaine was being flooded into the U.S., into the inner cities, into poor neighborhoods. Um, obviously, that's pretty distracting and pretty scary and crazy, but then also oddly becomes normalized at a certain point when you're a kid and you don't know anything other than that. However, um, as a, as a, also as a kid, I realized that that isn't anything I really wanted any part of. A lot of my friends decided that they were gonna get involved in that or, you know, maybe decided that they didn't really have any option or any choice. So they were selling drugs at a young age. They were, you know, doing drugs and drinking at middle school, you know, and it was pretty regular. I knew that I didn't want that. My father happened to be an alcoholic and he passed away when I was five. So I also grew up with that in the background of of my life as well. And I knew that I, I needed something different than that. And for me, that was school. And, you know, I found a lot of um, comfort, excitement and interest and structure and stability and positivity in school, at least relative to what my outside school life was like. What was different in you or in your circumstances that you went that way when your friends were going another way? Yeah, you know, it's it's strange. You know, Um, I have another close friend of mine, uh, Carlos, who grew up in the Fillmore, which is a similar neighborhood to the Taylor in San Francisco. We met in high school. Um, and also share the same story in this ongoing discussion around what was different about us or why did we have the experience that we had and other people didn't. You know, some of it, we were both pretty analytical kind of folks. Um, I do feel like we have this experience of tokenizing children. And I do feel like although you can label all these opportunities that I had as a kid as opportunities that I was ready for and I answered the call and I filled out the paperwork and I turned in the application. However, at a certain point, people started saying, hey, Joe, you should do this thing. You should go to this school. You should be in this program. You should be in this kind of a class. Um, You should go to college. 
And, you know, I don't think that adults and educators and folks were saying those same things to everybody. Sometimes people look for like, who is it going to work for, right? I think a lot of times we teach kids and we do our best and we do, we, we do status quo and the kids who make it were like, great. And if we think we can kind of save some, some, uh, some diamonds in the rough, then we do, right? And then we, we try to bet on a winning bet. Someone decides whether you're willing to play the game or not, right? And like, although I was a pretty conscious and critical youth, I didn't necessarily articulate everything as much, right? So, and I, I know how youth get treated when they are critical now, and they're not the ones who get signed up for those programs, right? Another way to say that is the tokenization of marginalized children, whether they're brown, immigrants, poor. They weren't betting on all the kids in my neighborhood. I just happened to see that and, you know, see some of the codes in the matrix to see this is going to be my way to make it so that that isn't my reality. Do you remember a particular time in school when you became aware that you were in an institution that was designed to perpetuate white supremacy culture? I was always in tracked classes. Um, so I was in the, the honors track of, of classes. And, um, and I went to you know a pretty prestigious high school. And even within that, there were still tracks. I think there, it was about the messages that I was receiving about what I was supposed to be doing with my life, that as I had friendships now with kids who are not in my same track classes, I was able to triangulate the message a little bit, right? And, you know, I would be with some of my friends and they would feel like they were bad at school and they weren't going to college. And this wasn't, this particular high school, Lowell High School in San Francisco was not for them, but it was for me and why was it for me? And then I think writing, the process of writing really sticks with me around how you're supposed to write, what language you're supposed to use in writing, and how you're supposed to revise it depending on the audience and what you're supposed to cut out and what you're supposed to keep. And, you know, with that goes speaking and language you use. And that was always troubling for me, right? The fact that I could not write how I thought or write how I, uh, I wanted to speak was crazy. But now I have enough academics and enough of enough degrees that I can like add slang back into my writing and now I have the, the foundation to be able to do that and still tell people they can you know kiss my ass if they don't enjoy that or not but I couldn't do that when I was an undergrad right and I couldn't do that when I was in high school and I mean with all of that comes the layers of race and class and gender for sure not for me as much as a male but definitely for females do you remember who you were reading maybe like in high school when you saw words on the page that made you go like that that's the way I want to write. Definitely not in high school. I can't say I read anything in high school that made me feel that way. I think when I was an undergrad, I got started getting exposed to, to spoken word poetry and slam poetry and seeing, you know, the, the combination of quote unquote high vocabulary and ac academic language combined with slang and references and pop culture and um, just different dialects. Seeing all that mesh in one was like, oh, right. Okay. One, that's at least being more um, true to the diversity of experiences and perspectives, but also why can't I just talk how I want to talk? You know, writing, I feel like Juno Diaz was a really great writer for me in that kind of regards. I feel like I, I saw a lot of um, just a mixture of, 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 of speech patterns. Recently, I've been reading, um, uh, recently I really like Chris Emden and Bettina Love's writing style. Um, it's funny, I've had this kind of ongoing evolution of my writing voice and now kind of breaking out of how I was supposed to write to now how I want to write. So now I'm getting more interested in just kind of a maybe a more poetic approach to writing. Um, and, you know, just the fact of telling it like it is, whether that involves slang words or just telling the truth. And um, I was speaking with Bettina Love a, a few months ago and she was talking about she wanted to write this book for black people by black people about what black people are going through without thinking about what white people think or care about the whole process. And for me, that really pushed me to say, well, how can I continue to speak and write without um, the fear, right, or the guilt or the worry of offending folks or you're not going to get my cultural references, right? But that person will, right? And I would, right? And so who am I supposed to be writing for and talking to? There's a lot of layers to all of that. Uh, you start teaching in Oakland, um, skipping, skipping some stuff here, but uh, teaching Spanish. And I wanted to ask you about um, the same kind of question about teaching. Was there a moment when you thought, I am part of something here that is doing systemic harm to indigenous kids, mm. black and brown kids? I mean, I think when I got to college, when I got to start teaching when I was done with college, I was still in a kind of a more hybrid place. Like I definitely knew that 
the curriculum needed to be altered. Um, and so I, I did a lot of that, right? I had, a, I had a lot of supplemental stuff to the curriculum and I started building my own curriculum. It was project-based learning based, so I could kind of do it all, anything I wanted. The pedagogy, I think my pedagogy still wasn't that strong yet. You know, I had not seen enough models of um, culture responsive teaching to really know that. So I would say, I feel like I was still doing some social justice kind of wrapped in white supremacy culture, right? And the idea that like, oh no, we still got to have timed essays and we still got to do notes and we still got to do dictations as, as a Spanish teacher. Um, you know, still needs to be 100% silent during the do now and the notes and just like all that kind of shit that like, yeah, it it does, but like, you know, does it need to be at 100% and does it need to be a battle? Um, I think also uh, around discipline, I was still uh, a novice you know, or, you know, I was still pretty like colonizing the mind with respect to how discipline in classroom management should be done, right? Who has authority in the classroom? Who doesn't? Who's supposed to win the battle? Um, how much, how much criticism should I get as a teacher, right? And um, how much is it my fault or how much is it the kid's fault? And um, I knew that it was a problem, but I didn't necessarily have as many avenues or alternatives of, of what to try. Um, but the fact that all my kids were black and brown in the city of Oakland. And to my knowledge, I felt like they were doing pretty well and weller than they could be doing. That felt, you know, overall positive, but you know, that was still early in my, earlier in my consciousness. What were you missing at that point? I think more reading, right? More theoretical frameworks, more examples. Like I, restorative justice was still a new idea to me. Or mm -hmm. It still was an unknown idea to me. Um, Culturally responsive teaching as it's defined now was still unknown to me, like culturally relevant teaching and like relating it was 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 uh, familiar. I think also, um, yeah, like an, a, a deeper mission or deeper, deeper purpose to want to do something about that was was missing, too, because I think the, the idea that like, oh, yeah, great. The world's really messed up and we need to do something about it. We need to teach the kids. But like we also got to teach them to like work within the messed up world so they got to like still pick up some of these like shitty skills that they that make them unhappy people like that part was still right like oh but in, especially in high school right but we got to get them ready for college and college is like this and the college still has SAT and the college whatever so like we still got to do these um, you know dehumanizing things that you know like uh, breath over depth right or like uh, teaching them irrelevant details or concepts that don't really help them you got to learn this stuff even though it doesn't matter and but this is good for you because there's going to be more of it <laughs> <laughs> so like just just keep believing that like it'll stop but, yeah. but it doesn't stop I th also like the pacing the urgency i think as well if it's just, like covering a lot of content want to make sure they're ready for the next level whatever that is um Wanted to make sure they're ready for like the shittiest professor they're gonna have. Like that concept of like, oh, well, you're really gonna have like, you might just have this like really bad professor to do just lecture. So like, I'm gonna do some lecturing. I was like, Whoa. yeah. Or you know, poor classroom management because like you're you're not gonna get these chances out there in the real world. So like, I'm gonna dehumanize you right now. It's like, it also doesn't make sense, you know. Like, but it's so built into you know, yeah, how we approach education. And so. You become a, a, a teacher leader and then a vice principal, and then you become principal of Visitation Valley. When did you decide at that point that you had an obligation to tackle white supremacy culture at your school? After undergrad, I knew that I had an obligation to address racism in school, systemic racism, systemic inequities. I knew that something needed to be done to change the outcomes the students were experiencing. The question is more so about what theory of action, right, or what strategy is really going to work. So I took all these different approaches to trying to have conversations around changing the practices that we were doing as adults with hopes that the outcomes would be different for the students. And, you know, some of this, some of these looked at defining race or racism or defining implicit bias or, you know, trying to get people to believe that you do have implicit bias. Um, but we didn't necessarily get to the place of well, what you're supposed to do differently now that you know that you have implicit bias and um, how do you be different? Uh, you know, we talked about culture responsive teaching and read Zaretta Hammond's book and had some conversations, but there was still, you know, lots of um, confusion, some resistance, um, and then a lack of kind of follow through. When you look back, is there a point you can go like, <clears throat> this is when we went from like trying stuff and kind of feeling like there was something off 
to like tackling it in a coherent way? Um, I was going into my fourth year, actually it was last year, and I started focusing a lot on norms specifically. I was Is like, this, are we talking like August? Yeah, like beginning of the school year. So we come back from the summer um, and it's the, we have two days of in-service professional development before we get ready for the kids to come back. And um, I decided that we needed to have the right norms, right? With the, the, the belief that with the right norms in place, perhaps we would have better conversations that would push our practice, that would have us change things that we're doing. So like talking to your teachers walk in, it's like what, eight in the morning, nine in the morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 8.30. 8.30. What do they see? What's How does this day start? Yeah, so this day, you know, folks come in, you know, there's usually some music playing, there's some pastries, right? You sign in, hello, how was the summer? Good to see you. Um, you know, the first day, you know, we do some, um, you know, community building, a little bit around visioning for the year, a little bit around goals for the year, some games, you know, what are the rules? What are the, what's the handbook that we're, we're looking at this year? Um, and then on this particular uh, session, I think it was the afternoon of, of day one, I opened up this norm conversation. Um, and we actually were, we used a reading to ground us. This is a pretty cool reading called From um, Safe Spaces to Brave Spaces. Um, and it talks about um, how norms can either facilitate great things or stymie the process, right? Or promote the status quo. This particular one was specifically talking about race, right? That in a lot of the norms that we use um, in organizations and schools, they are pretty white centered and actually about maintaining the status quo and um, avoiding conflict, avoiding things that are actually going to allow people to break through. So we did this reading and I felt like it was pretty specific, right? Norms, race, racism, systemic oppression. It's kind of all in there, I would say, and it was a reading that helped crystallize some things for me, although I understood the power of norms before I read this reading. But the question is, you know, what, in this case, you know, somewhat theoretical framework would allow folks to see like, oh, we might need different norms so we can actually talk differently to each other. You're doing, so uh, after lunch, um, first of all, what's the demographic breakdown of your teaching staff? Um, it's always been about half-half white folks of color. There's about 40 teachers, about another 10 support staff, about 400 kids. So roughly 50% white, and of the teachers who are people of color, like what's the kind of breakdown within that? <sighs> um, you know, pretty even, depending on the year. Uh, a lot of black folks, um, a good amount of um, Asian American folks. We haven't really had too many um, Latinx folks over the years a couple here and there, um, but for some reason that's always been a little low. A couple Filipino staff, a couple Samoan staff, depending on the year. Um, yeah, but you know, pretty good mixture. What's interesting about that is even in this particular conversation where we're looking at norms and race, and this was supposed to springboard folks into thinking, well, what norms might we need so that we can actually have braver conversations? It was pretty mixed, and I almost wanna say like there were more folks of color in the room that day um, based on just hiring that year. And the conversation still was superficial. It was still flat. It still felt like t tense and uncomfortable, right? We weren't even talking about somebody specifically. We were talking about a third party, right? Text, it's not even like that personal to somebody, right? And we were avoiding the conversation. Folks were not really talking about race. Folks were talking about power dynamics and administration and teachers and you know, not quite power dynamics with respect to race. So tell me more about like what like a superficial conversation in this context looks like. Like what kind right. of things are people saying? Yeah, I mean, so the question was like, so what you know, what has resonated with you about this reading? What norms might we need, right? I mean, it was the prompt at least we, we people got stuck, so we weren't able to get to the place of writing the actual norm. So I kind of raised up this question: of, Well, what's really standing out, right? And what can we take away from this conversation and kind of move into the next time we can pick this back up? You know, it was just a lot of like speaking your truth, but people don't feel safe to speak the truth because they don't have tenure and just like just conversations don't have anything to do with race unless you're saying folks of color don't have tenure because they feel uncomfortable in a white um, organization which is different but that was not what the conversation was. and what is what is the tenure policy at your school uh, in the in the state um, you work two years and you get tenure for, right. for life for the most part um, so, you know, and I think what was interesting is that there were even a couple comments by folks of color who said something was like, oh, okay, well now, okay, something's coming up here, right? There, there's opportunities, right, where doors cracked and people could kind of say like, okay, yes, let's build onto that, whether that's another person of color or a white ally or a white co-conspirator saying, that's right, I want to be an organization that actually is pushing so that uh, Mrs. Such and Such doesn't feel uh, silenced as a brown person in a room. 
But in that particular moment, and there were a couple other comments, there's a quick pivot, right? Or a completely unrelated comment that has nothing to do with that person said and nothing to do with race, right? Or, you know, a comment that's done strategically to say, yeah, like, what about gender here? And it was just like, oh, yeah, but like the reading's all about race and like norms and race. And like, unless you're talking about, unless you want to go for like gender and patriarchy and women being silent, unless you're going to go that far, then like, don't just say what about gender so that we just like pivot from race and also stay superficial with gender. What were you hoping that conversation was going to yeah, be Yeah, like? so, I mean, you know, I hoped that folks would have a, a concept of how norms could either push us deeper or keep us superficial, right? Make us braver to, to push each other or stay safe, right? And we, unfortunately, we didn't really have this concept of white fragility in the lexicon at this time, right? The book had just come out, but everybody didn't really know, right? So, like, ideally, it would be norms that would push past white fragility or strengthen, uh, you know, white fragility so we can have a deeper conversation around race. But that didn't happen. So there's kind of a meta thing going here where like, it sounds like you were hoping the staff was going to analyze and talk about a particular problem and instead they exhibited that particular problem. Yeah, you know, I was hoping folks would say, yeah, well, I had this experience and, you know, the norms didn't really help me do this or based on how this, based on someone interpreting the norms, it actually kept me feeling this way so it didn't really make me feel comfortable as a person of color and it didn't really push us to push our practice, right? I mean, looking back now, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? There's all kind of different prompts I would have used, right? Um, but I was hoping that the reading and some of the conversation would kind of move us there. But we didn't. And, you know, I had to make a statement at the end of like, okay, well, this is where we're at. You know, I, I, I want to observe where we're at. We were not comfortable talking about race. However, the conversation is not going away. We'll regroup with our teams and figure out what to do next. But we will need some braver norms, right? We will need... Um, you know, more brave space to do the work that needs to be done. So I kind of just took it as like a time to reflect and regroup, like what to do next and seeing that like that still wasn't, you know, something that was going to unlock folks. What prompt would you use if you're doing that? I think more specifics, right? So like, yeah, you got to give some examples of, okay, well, like in this scenario, can you see how this norm would help or hurt, right? Or in the scenario, what norm might be useful Right. Or if everyone had X norm, how could that help this situation and giving people particular situations? Right. We're in a staff meeting. It looks like this. We're in a grade level meeting. We're having this conversation. Um, we are we just er- observed a classroom. This is what we saw. A comment gets said. How to respond to the comment. Right. This is almost like, you know, a curriculum to kind of have people unlearn practices, right? Unlearn some habits and then learn some new practices that lead them in a different kind of way. So, but overall specifics. And then I think really in that case, some, some vocabulary that folks weren't really some shared understandings that folks didn't really have and some space for people to tell their truth, right? Because like in that particular room there, I'm sure folks of color have had a lot of experiences of how norms have worked for them or not, but that really wasn't being raised up and the space still wasn't safe enough for marginalized folks to speak on their oppression. You know, how to do that, how to share those stories, um, and, you know, not, not try to worry about how white people feel in the process. So you got in the car at the end of that first in-service day. How are you feeling? That day I definitely felt defeated, you know. I felt like, damn, this is yet another take, you know, yet another attempt. And we still didn't get to where I want us to get to. I can't say I felt like giving up. But I definitely felt like, I definitely felt at a loss of like what to do next. And also, cause like you can't just go back after something fails and I say, yeah, you messed up guys. Just like with, with, with students when we're learning something, the response is, well, this is information, right? This is some formative data that I can use of like, okay, well, this is where we're at. What do we do next, right? Like this, that was my check for understanding. So therefore, you know, some, some different learning or unlearning is needed. Um, so I kind of just kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit to think, what else is there? What else can I can I pull out? And you know, where's the gap, right? I mean, it's it's, it's also this piece of similar to zone of proximal development, right? Of like, oh, this is where we're at. So what's next, right? And um, I, I feel like ZPD is an interesting concept because like a lot of times we're thinking about sh- uh, about what's just past, what's just what's at the learning edge, what's in the ZPD. And, but I feel like a lot of times with racial equity work or um, equity work in general we actually need to expand where the goal is because i think sometimes people always think that like oh i just have to take one step further and as long as i'm not being pushed too hard that's okay but what it actually led me to was actually like blowing that up right and say like well let's just go what's 10 zpd levels above and say that's where we're trying to get to how do we get there and i do feel like that kind of led me to some white supremacy culture thinking 
um, or at least more, maybe not necessarily thinking, but led me to looking for some frameworks that kind of start to break some of that down to just expand where we're really trying to go. So at that first in-service day, at that point, would you have ter- used the term white supremacist culture? No, nah, I mean, not at all. I mean, I think not even white supremacy, not even white fragility, systemic racism, oppression, inequity. Yeah, I was definitely comfortable using those terms um, in, in a school setting, at least. In the HBO series of last year, probably the credits are rolling as you're like driving home from that first thing, feeling defeated. Yeah. So how does episode two start? <laughs> the next couple months, we kind of just jumped into like our normal kind of professional development of work. I was kind of behind the scenes kind of regrouping, you know, it's almost like um, you watch these movies, these sports movies where like, oh, there's this new team comes together and they just get hammered in the first game, right? And it's like the coach is like, oh, you gotta get, we gotta get you guys in shape. Right. And then there's just like this over and over um, kind of planning and coaching and, and conditioning, right, at least with a sports metaphor. For me, on the other end, I was um, having some experiences outside of the school that was pushing my practice and allowing me to kind of practice some stuff to ultimately do with my staff. Who was on your team? You know, with, with that topic, with the topics of racism and white supremacy culture, it was uncertain, you know, and I think that's one of the things that has led me to wanting to go deeper and deeper and deeper because the lines have not always been drawn, right? It's unclear who's on your team when when it's not clear what the enemy is and what the fight really is. So then therefore folks don't really know, right? And I do think there were some folks that I had a feeling, I don't know, I'm having some conversations, but like unfortunately it wasn't the culture where folks were saying, no, I really want to do something about racism in the school. A couple, not that many. I did slowly try to work with my administrative team that was kind of my closest kind of locus of control, um, my two assistant principals. And while I was kind of learning outside of the school, I was trying to bring that into some of the conversations I was having with my assistant principals. And then about midway through the semester, I put a date on the calendar and I said, uh, in December, we're coming back to what I called Brave Norms Part Two. And I just said, we got some more work to do. We're coming back to this. And about midway through the semester also, I decided that we we're gonna go deeper than that. And I decided that we we're gonna go into white supremacy culture. And then I started figuring out how am I gonna do this and how am I gonna tackle this and what type of learning space am I gonna to create to go deeper and get clearer and you know hopefully come up with some, you know, more specific next steps. I don't wanna just like harp on that moment of your of you feeling defeated, but like who did you tell? Who 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 was it who you could say, Oh, that was awful? Like, oh that was really disappointing. Yeah, my mentors. I mean, I definitely had a, a couple coaches, both like formal and informal, at least like three or five, six people that I check in with. I, I mean, I tend to be pretty close with both folks that are practicing principles with me and people who've been principals before and some happen to be my supervisor. So I would check in with them and say, oh, this is what happened. I don't know, I don't know what to do next. And for me, I talk a lot of things things through in, in dialogue. Um, so that kind of got me thinking. And those those formal and informal mentors, where, how, where did you sort of pick them up on your journey? Some through like formal channels, like you're a principal, so you need a principal coach and that just kind of happens. Some just through the grapevine of like, oh, I know this person, I know this person, you should connect with that person because you seem like you'd get along and they seem like they might push you, you might be interested in that. And and also I just tend to like kind of nurture relationships that are already there that if I, if I feel like I can learn something from that person, even if it was, even if we initially meant to just talk about PBL, but they seem like they have a pretty sharp racial equity consciousness, then we'll talk about that too, just because that'll help me. And when you said like the great, but I'm kind of I'm digging this because I think like one of the biggest things that te- teachers and school leaders doing this kind of work feel is isolation. Mm. So meeting somebody who's like going like just to me, it's like a kind of an unusual thing to be like, oh yeah, there were like three to six people, you know, a few people not at my school who I was still in contact with who mm. I could have these really intense conversations with. So like, I just want to take a moment on like, is that. Is that like a social media thing that you like that grapevine? Probably more through in person. I think I originally met these people just through shared space. Like we were both part of this particular program or we work in San Francisco, right? Or we're both principals. And I, at some point I cross paths with them. I'm someone who definitely puts a lot out there just because like same thing like you said, like I want to know who's on my team, right? And we need more people on the team. So I'm constantly kind of putting things out because I do know that there's, you know, strength in numbers and, you know, that'll push practice for, for me as an individual too. So, yeah, I see who responds and people, if they're kind of about that kind of stuff, then great. We'll keep talking. And like I got people who, who we still kind of coach each other years down the road, right? And we don't share space at all anymore. 
what I'm kind of picturing is that when you're hearing those conversations where what you talked about, somebody gets up and says something kind of brave and honest about race and everybody else pivots away from it, you're like, I should talk to that person. That's right. Things over. That's right. When you're doing that kind of training montage here where you you lost the first game and the coach got you together, mm-hmm. you said you were doing some outside. What was that outside stuff? So when I was a part of a, a collective of school principals that were committed to equity work in general, and I was actually... Uh, leading and steering some of that group and we were actually using this white supremacy culture text with that group not that much definitely a lot in the beginning and then a little bit monthly so I got an opportunity to kind of just test some stuff out with principals right definitely not people who I supervise or there's not a lot of like positional like dynamics or tension there Mm -hmm. so I was able to kind of both be practice leading something also be a little bit of a learner and then there was another some another grouping of principals that same thing, similar conversation. So I just got to like test it out, like prototype it. And what was that group? What's that collective called? Um, the first one was called the Superintendent Leadership Fellows, uh, which was a application based monthly gathering of principals in San Francisco. And that was a group of principals who were like committed to equity work. Yeah, that is a sneaky name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know what why they didn't call it what it is, but yeah, strange, but it was cool. And what, what's the, you said, what is the text that you were reading, the white supremacy culture text? Uh, yeah, it's, I think the title is white supremacy culture in organizations, I think. Um, or just a white less, supremacy less culture. Sneaky. Less sneaky. Yeah, title. that was pretty direct. Um, yeah, someone in the summer before had uh, just given me, an, two people actually, two of my coaches actually, two, through two, two different spaces that, hey, Joe, you should take a look at this. I was like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. And I like didn't even look at it. And then like another person said, oh, you should take a look. I was like, damn, okay. Maybe I should, you know, like, let me actually pull this out. And I started reading it. Um, and I was like, this is pretty interesting. And then we started using it in a couple other spaces. And then for me, it clicked when I kind of saw, um, you know, just where some of the gaps were at the school. Um, so, yeah, it's called White Supremacy Culture. It breaks down 15 characteristics of white supremacy culture in organizations in general, not, not particularly in schools. I feel like it was written more for like a nonprofit or maybe even a business space. And it talks about how white supremacy culture shows up. 15 ways and then also antidotes to those um, traits all right so let's go back to december um brave norms part two do you have a name for it yeah well that's what it was called and then it turned into (laughs) exploring white supremacy culture yeah there's like an all staff we we meet every two weeks for about two hours okay Um, this was one of those sessions i think one of the last ones of the year before we went on break so everyone's (laughs) take a break from playing the holiday party because uh Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a weird time to do it. I mean, I definitely would not have done it that time of the year, much better in the beginning of the year, two hours. And the goal was to like make white supremacy culture more visible to kind of look at some examples um, and think about, you know, what are implications for what we might need to do as a school. So it starts. So is this the same deal? They show up, there's pastries. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Same thing. Play some games first. I kind of, you know, what are your go to games? Uh, we played a lot of like apple to apple variation type games last mm-hmm. year. Um, you know, typical kind of stuff, human knot, you know, passing around a balloon or something, whatever, you know, just stuff to get people moving and kind of have some fun. Um, which is interesting, right? Cause like even the concept of like, we can't just start white supremacy culture is white supremacy culture, right? That did like, Hey, welcome. All right. This is what we're doing today. Right? Like, it's interesting that like, we got to kind of like ease it in a little bit, you know, like. What if we only got 30 minutes, right? Like I got to use half the time on the game still. So anyway, so we, you know, we play some games and then um, we actually did some, some terminology to make sure everyone was now at least working with exposure to definitions of some key terms, maybe not a deeper understanding, but make sure you understand what a microaggression is, make sure you understand what systemic oppression is, equity is. So we did a little bit of um, foundational terminology. We actually spent some time talking about white fragility. That really helped. So, so this particular agenda kind of evolved or was revised almost like six or seven times before it actually was used um, with the whole staff. Um, and one of the things I ended up adding to it was some meaning making and some reflection around white fragility before we would talk about white supremacy culture right because like you said like how often can you come into a room and say we're going to be talking about white supremacy culture today and there's reasons why we can't do that and reasons why we don't and why we shouldn't and why we're uncomfortable most often it's white fragility right so doing that also really helps set the tone for folks that now now there's a term for how you might react to this actual conversation or applying the conversation this is the term. And now here you have 
nice white lady saying all these things that people of color have been saying for years, saying the things that may happen for you. So in one hand, it's building some scaffolding or some understanding for folks about what might be happening for them through the process. And it's also kind of doing some norming too, right? And, you know, in an ingenious kind of way, it's also kind of norming the space a little bit against white fragility, right? Because if you stand up and bang your hand on the table or yell at somebody or do whatever that is, like, it, and now we have a name for that. And it's also been established that that's actually a negative thing to do, right? And that's actually not protection and whatever, whatever the hell way we justify um, uh, white fragility and defensiveness. I'm really curious about, like, the vibe in the room. Yeah. At this. So it was I weird, wanna, man. It I want to make weird. a scale of zero <laughs> to an episode of The Office in like degree of awkwardness in the space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, so I'll, I'll say coming into this particular meeting, even the weeks leading up to it, like I could feel it, you know, like one, because like I started forecasting it like weeks out, right? Maybe even like a month out. Um, we're going to be having this conversation in December here. If you want to read the article, I kind of put that out like almost two weeks in advance. So like you can skim it so you kind of have a little bit of understanding of where we're going. And I started dropping some of the terms in our weekly bulletin as well, like white fragility, like systemic oppression. And either it was all in my head, right? And all the tension was there. Or you could feel the tension kind of like building up to this, this day and even kind of walking into the room. Like I definitely had a feeling that it was going to be, yeah, I expected it to be difficult. <laughs> and I expected it to be tense and I expected fo some folks that could just like um, not be present, you know, either physically or mentally. Right. Yeah. However, like everybody was there, you know, like that day, I thought people were going to kind of like trickle in, you know, mm -hmm. but like hey, everybody's there. And I was like, all right, this is going down, you know? Um, and, you know, it, it felt awkward, man, you know, I don't know, seven, eight or so. And then like, when we got to the place of like, we're going to watch this Robin D'Angelo clip talking about white fragility, it was like pin drop silence, you know, silent. Not necessarily, I mean, tense, for, yeah, you call that tension, but it didn't seem like everybody was like, we're shuffling in their seats, like, right, like looking for the exit. It wasn't like that. It was just kind of like, it felt like engagement, which felt positive, but like, um, it's always felt very um, tense or awkward, right? The response is been defensiveness, right? Or, or guilt or what shame, I don't know what it is, but like it, it, it doesn't look like engagement always. Um, so even through the process, like that was still kind of tense, but when we got to the place where people were making some meaning of it, it definitely felt engaging. It didn't, I wouldn't say it felt tense. Were you ever worried about your own authority? Yeah, like how, where am I gonna away. be at coming out of this? Yeah, for sure. There definitely was some responses in previous years of like, oh, we're talking too much about black students or we're talking too much about race or I feel targeted or whatever that is. And like, there's definitely some, some structural ways white folks can maintain white supremacy within organizations, right? That are, that we call normal systems, right? Like writing a complaint, right? Like uh, airing a grievance, right? Saying that it's a hostile work environment and depending who you are, on the other end of HR, hearing that, you can either legitimize that and say, oh, that's right, yeah, that's right, I'm white, you're white, and that person's making you feel bad about your whiteness. That sounds like the definition of a hostile work environment. You can interpret that shit somehow if you want to, right? I mean, or you can be like, no, dude, that's not hostile, it's called learning. You need to learn. But I was a little bit worried. I was kind of also like, kind of nose holes barred my fourth year too. Like I just kind of wasn't tripping, you know? I was like, how can I go further? How can I push people more? So I, I kind of a little bit had a death wish, you could say, you know, with, you know, a healthy death wish, right? I don't know, I don't know. I, who knows, right? But <laughs> I've got a one-year-old, what better time <laughs> to go out? And I guess, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of was like, I don't care, you know? Like it needs to happen. I've been here, this is my fourth year, whatever. Let's see what happens. Of your staff, how many, like what kind of percent would you say were like actively resistant to talking about race? You know, like I, I would say, this is the weird thing, right? So like, even for the folks who are comfortable talking about race, when you get into a certain setting, you all of a sudden get uncomfortable, right? So even if like philosophically, like you're like, oh yeah, I really like having these conversations. And when I'm in a place where I have a lot of trust and we do have sh shared agreement on who the enemy really is, I'm comfortable. But when we get into this space of like people thinking about their job, right? And their job security and, and, and also their relationships with other white people in the organization, even people of color would feel uncomfortable. But if I'm having a one-on-one -on -one, or it's just three of us, we're at the water cooler, right? Or we're in the parking lot and we're talking about some crazy shit that just happened. We can quickly have a conversation where we're not scared. That being said, you know, there's probably, you know, 
a pretty, I don't know, 15, 20% of folks who were really uncomfortable with it. But the problem with it is that a lot of times those people who are uncomfortable occupy so much of the airtime, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes sit in a lot of the formal and informal power positions in a school too, that like now they do lean, lean, lean on and influence what people do and what they're willing to say because they don't want to upset that person who has the juice, you know? It was your fourth year at that point. Had that number of people dropped? Had people been leaving, kind of going like, this isn't the kind of place I want to be? <sighs> For sure. People had moved on. I don't think it was always clear what, why they were moving. I mean, there definitely were a lot of changes happening in the school. I mean, mindset-wise, structural, like our bell schedule, the curriculum we were doing. So, like, it could have been any number of reasons people would leave. It's, it's unclear if they were, like, running from the racial conversation or not. Um I'm sure maybe some were, but I don't think it was out of the bag enough for folks to really make that decision, you know? So I feel like some of the things that have pushed me to go be more explicit and bold is because now people have to decide if this is what they're with or not. Whereas if you're just saying like diversity, everyone's like, yeah, sure, diversity sounds cool. I like Indian food, you know, like, cool. Yeah, sure, we should celebrate Black History Month. I'm cool with diversity, right? But if you're saying uh, decolonizing your mind, right, or you're talking about um, exposing white supremacy culture and how perpetrators of that, then it starts to get a little bit like, I don't know where I stand on that. I don't know how much of that I really want to own. People can make more of a decision at that point. Yeah. Um, do they? Eh, I don't know, you know? People are also like patient and, I don't know, in denial too, right? I mean, denial could last for years. But there's, an, I mean, there's an interesting, there's like an interesting kind of counterintuitive leadership strategy thing, I think like kind of embedded in this, which is like on a certain level, if people wanted to be in a traditional school space, they already left years ago because it was getting crazy in other ways. Like you change the bell schedule, yeah. you change the furniture, you'd like, right. people had to sit, a certain number of people were like, those people had already left. Um, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> And sometimes it's also like who comes in, right? I mean, part of it, you know, d definitely people are tied to schools and, you know, we, we're creatures are habit. Um, but sometimes people do leave for various reasons. But I think it's also about who do we bring in. And I think mm -hmm. I was pretty strategic with not necessarily going and finding the best person I can find just because, like, it, it's hard. Like, there's not tons of people who want to be teachers. So it's not like I'm scouring the earth for, uh, you know, people. Um, in a city like San Francisco, you, you got to work with who's there, right? And like, yeah. there's only so many people willing to come to San Francisco and work in a tough school and work in a Title I school. And then now, what the best thing I could do is say, well, this is the kind of things we're working on. This is kind of what we're about and this is the directions we're going. And whether that's through um, interview conversations or just plastering stuff on our website or whatever that is, I could be strategic about or I can be tra transparent about what we're doing to hopefully attract people who are really about doing it. and I do think over the years we definitely got more and more of those kind of folks that kind of tip the scale towards a direction of openness and growth and anti-racism and all the good things that kids need. And had you got kind of pushback or discomfort when people uh, at the end of that first one in August? Uh, you know, things bubble up in different ways, right? Things are not always like as bold as like being shared in a meeting. Sometimes it's like this person talks to this person, that person, that person, and it gets to me. And, you know, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, changed at that point. But like what got to me was not like, oh, this is great, Joe. Keep doing that, right? It was like so-and-so's not happy or people are not happy, right? Right? Um, as opposed to, no, we're actually really happy with this conversation. Let's go, right? Like that, sometimes that gets to me, but a lot of times the negativity uh, uh, pops all around and gets back to me. Um, and like, we do a lot of feedback too, right? Like just how was the meeting? Was it positive? Was it negative? What worked? What, what would you change? And sometimes that, that resistance or um, those attacks or those judgments pop in that feedback too, right? Of like, yeah, people feeling unhappy or uncomfortable or targeted or whatever that might be, right? And the question is, how do we respond to that, right? Either do I say, okay, great, let me go back. Yeah, white fragility wins again. Let me go back and scale it back. Or do I try to push past that? Yeah. So now it's December. You've had this intense, but not necessarily negative mm -hmm. two hour session where yeah. you've like, and you've named white fragility and you've hopefully vaccinated a little bit that it's like a certain number of strategies hold less power because they are identifiable for what they right. are. Right. And you have a way of naming that. Now you have a way of naming that, but do you think anyone would like, if someone did something, would you, would, would you, would someone in a meeting have kind of said like, 
kind of feel like you're exhibiting white fragility right now. You know, not yet, but I did notice like the second half of the year getting into the spring, we ended up doing some more sessions as a staff on this. But even outside of those sessions, conversations or references to white supremacy culture started happening. At least at least the ones that I heard, right? I'm sure there were other ones that I didn't hear about, but people shared with me, right? Or yeah. people talked about bringing this conversation outside of the school or bringing it to another body of, uh, that they're a part of or bringing it to their family or their friends or whatever. So yeah, I would say it definitely started kind of permeating around. And how do you track where your staff's at? Do you like do exit cards? Do you, what's the kind of... Yeah, for the most part, just kind of like exit ticket kind of feedback forms. Um, mm-hmm. It definitely would be nice to kind of have some kind of pre-post data around beliefs yeah. and consciousness. But what, were those, and what did those exit tickets say after that second one? Mostly positive. Mostly, you know, I appreciated this. This was interesting. Um, definitely some like, I want to go deeper and I want to know more, which isn't always the the case i do think that is what really uh, was an indicator that it was the right thing to do a lot of times Mm -hmm. we do things people are like yeah i'm done with this i'm not really interested anymore and i didn't really need it to start right Mm -hmm. um whereas this led people to like okay i'd like to do something about this now which is like oh whoa you know and that not being hey this is what you're going to do about it right like kind of leaving top down from the leader folks were more so asking and more so curious um, and then a little bit of negative response too about s- some comments uh, speaking that folks were not comfortable with the conversation or did not believe it was the thing we should be doing. So yeah, we took all of that and decided how to continue. How do you keep those negative comments from being like the thing that's sitting in your head all Christmas break? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we, we definitely have like this negativity bias, right? Um, you focus, fixate on the one thing that someone said that was negative. But you know, like for me, like the fact that that wasn't the overwhelming pattern is encouraging. And then also like, it also feeds me too, because one, like I want it to be even more clear. You know, I want it to be even more transparent, more explicit that that's what we're doing, right? That either you are interested in growing your consciousness or you decide that you want to do something else with your life or you want to do something else with where you work because this is kind of what we're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. So it, it does kind of empower me a little bit to continue, but it also challenges me to figure out what am I going to do to empower the folks who feel positively about this and scaffold a little bit for the folks that may still be in the middle, right? Because that one person or those three people who are, who are speaking negatively in their response, we all have those same thoughts in our mind, right? Our subconscious that mm-hmm. kind of tells us that we shouldn't... Um, do certain things. So it is good data to figure out, you know, how do we scaffold for that or, or, or uh, make it, make it more foolproof, you know? Mm-hmm. So then you have, um, you, you, you do another two hour session. Um, like after December. Yeah. Yeah. So actually the f- crazy thing is that that was the only one scheduled for like the rest of the year, at least relative to this topic. Like I never, I did not approach it as we're gonna do a whole bunch of sessions on this because we had a whole bunch of other things planned. Mm-hmm. And as the principal, I was stepping out of leading a lot of those spaces. And I, I said like, okay, I'm gonna step out from the rest of these, but like I'm doing one December and this is what we're doing. Um, so then we actually regroup uh, this meeting in our leadership team of teachers. We regroup to kind of look at the feedback and look at the patterns, try to figure out what do we do next and how do we take this to inform what we do next. But the next thing was slated to be, you know, maybe some more academics, some more instructional, some more PBL related stuff for the, the spring semester. But folks in the leadership team actually decided that we weren't done with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the message and the decision from the teachers on the leadership team was to continue unpacking this and going deeper and not letting the moment pass and thinking about what we actually could do about it, which was, you know, for me astounding, right? Usually that's something that I might be pushing as a leader and especially someone who's pushing the envelope on racial equity work. But um, to have that come from teachers and not only was the message that we're not done and we need to continue with this, it was, and this needs to be teacher led. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to take the next three months off, you know, like, awesome, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of what we did for the next couple of months. Um, the teachers planned a couple of sessions of taking some of the concepts from white supremacy culture and then going deeper into it in one session and then actually taking it and looking at implicit bias and discipline practices in another session. So we ended up continuing for, you know, about three more sessions, all teacher-led, trying to you know, look at going deeper and then applying it. So you did one on implicit bias and discipline, Yes. And what were the other two on? One was on like going deep, like they just wanted like a part two of like, we just didn't have enough time to talk about it. People just want to talk about it more to figure out what it is. So um, one of the sessions was just 
going deeper into it and then actually deciding which ones we really need to do something about. Was there one that you were just like, man, that was awesome? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the concept of connecting white supremacy culture to implicit bias, to classroom management, to discipline, to the outcomes that we see with the disproportionality of who gets disciplined and who gets suspended and referral, it's huge. I mean, that is, that's it, right? Because you can have a conversation about changing practices minus all of the foundational philosophical um, pieces. Um, so seeing that merge happen um, was, was pretty cool. Yeah, I knew a, a school principal in England who said like there was a point when he, his staff like read all kinds of education theory. He said it reached a point where we were probably the best, most knowledgeable staff in the country on education theory. But what happens on a wet Wednesday afternoon mm. is a different story. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it's yeah. And then because then there's the next level, too, of like, yeah, right. We know all these things. Right. And what, how are we going to do? How are we going to be different still? Yeah. So you get to the end of the year. Um, you've had this kind of amazing thing where the teacher leadership, the teacher leaders have taken over and want to continue moving this thing forward as a staff. Where were you at the end of the year? I think things were more clear, for sure. Um, it felt like we were ending more united. I mean, it's the end of the year, so it's hard, and people are tired and ready for a break regardless. But it just felt like we were able to speak a little bit more of the same language, mm -hmm. I would say. Were students picking up on it? You know, we, we made an active decision not to bring it to the students yet because we, we wanted it to um, wanted the adults to have a lot of time to think about it. Um, and we didn't want to rush that, especially, yeah. and also we didn't want to rush folks who did not have a good enough understanding enough of it to start talking to students about it. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, truthfully, like this year, right. And the following year is when we start thinking about what do we intentionally do with students? Um, and what language do we use? What terminology and frameworks do we bring the students, right? So that they understand some of this other than just like good, bad, like follow the rules, don't follow the rules. And so it wasn't that long ago still that you had your August two-day in service yeah. for this year. Were you talking about white supremacy culture in that? I was, yeah. Yes. I used it as a way to set the tone for the year to kind of say, yeah, we did all these things last year. The question this year is, what are we going to do differently, mm -hmm. right? And how are we going to let this now inform our actions and our practices? And how do we have a more anti-racist school and anti-racist practices? Um, so part of it was just setting the tone now with like some common framework and some common language that the majority, a good 90% of the staff had already. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was um, cool. I mean, I actually, a couple of weeks ago, I have like a, a weekly bulletin where, you know, it's just updates for the week. Um, I think we we're in week four. And I wrote about white supremacy culture, defensiveness, um, wanting to always be right with respect to classroom management and, mm -hmm. and disciplining kids, especially as like the honeymoon starts to wear off. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we start to get short on patience with kids and start to dehumanize them for the most part, right, or give up on them, right? So like um, that was a small space for me to say, hey, let's have a, you know, a call back to some of the stuff we were talking about and like, let's pull on that, right? So that when you're thinking about what you're gonna say to that particular student, you got some other things you can kind of pull from, but that wasn't the case before. If I came in knowing nothing about this, where would I see the effect of that in the classrooms and in the hallways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see, it's still, still pretty early. Hopefully you'll see it in the relationships between adults and students. I would hope that folks see it in the design of their curriculum and their pedagogy a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of unlearning to, to get away from our traditional approach to schooling, though. Yeah. But I would hope you see it there. I would hope you see it in some of the staff meetings, you know, just of like how, how we do things, the fact that we do want norms that actually um, push our practice, that actually um, value folks in the room. But all that stuff takes time because like, you know, like you said, like on a wet Wednesday or when it's like 90 degrees hot or the honeymoon's over or, you know, this kid just cussed you out or kid's been absent for like two weeks and they're back in the middle of a project, whatever that is, like those are all the things where mm -hmm. we go back into this habit, right, of, well, I'm just going to like dehumanize you and treat you how you should be treated based on something being your fault, whatever, whatever, you know, like it's hard to unlearn. So I think it takes a lot of reminders and a lot of practice and you know, it takes years for sure. Yeah. 
It's scary when a kid like directly challenges you in front of the whole class, and you're like, I could lose the room right now. Like, but then even that concept, brother, I'm to... supposed to have the room. Yeah, you know I mean, it's just all that. Like, versus like, we got some things to do, and I mean, I, I, mean, I know folks down here at High Tech High have more of a student centered approach, mm -hmm. but still, you got these ideas of like, but well, we still gotta get this stuff done, and I don't got time for this question right now, son. You know, like whatever that is, yeah. right? And there's a fine line and an art to how much you entertain and how much you don't, and. You know, there's a there's a there's a spectrum for sure. Um, yeah. I think it's just about being aware of that and constantly reflective um, to make sure that we're not just doing status quo, right? And we're not just uh, doing the same thing we've been doing, especially under a different package by a different name, but we're still getting the same outcomes. Like, sounds like we're not doing anything different. Mm -hmm. Projecting forward to like beginning in next year. What do you want the school to feel like based on this? What do you want to see in classrooms? What do you want to see in the hallway? I mean, I would love for to, for students to feel like they have more agency, of course, in the school, for them to feel more empowered, for them to feel like they're more interested in what they're learning because it is what they want to learn and they have some, some power in what that process is. I definitely want to see outcomes change that have been pretty flatlined for a long time around performance on standardized tests, engagement in the classroom, right? Just observationally, um, discipline, disproportionality. I would definitely want to see those things change. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I want to see the most marginalized kids not feel marginalized and not continue to be marginalized. And it's hard, I mean, we're trying to make a system, we should be trying to make a system for the most marginalized kid as opposed to keeping the system as it is and trying to give a couple bells and whistles to the marginalized kids. Mm -hmm. um, so ideally, like you don't really have marginalized kids, right? Ideally, um, those kids are showing some of the same practices as the kids who are not marginal. That was Joe Truss, principal of Visitation Valley Middle School in San Francisco. And this has been the Unboxed Learning Podcast, written and produced by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. You can find links to all the books and articles Joe mentioned in our show notes. Joe has a full-day workshop on dismantling white supremacy culture coming up on Saturday, November 2nd in San Francisco. You can find out all about it on his website at www.culturallyresponsiveleadership.com. Also check him out on Twitter at Trust Leadership. Thanks for listening.